So today I'm going to be talking about threshold signatures and mostly I'm just going to be explaining what they are. So I'm sure many of you will already be aware that there is such a thing as cryptographic signatures. Really what we're trying to do here is emulate something that we have in the real world called signatures, where you're just trying to verify that a message comes from the person that you think that it comes from. So a classic example of this would be when you have like a child that wants to get out of PE, maybe it's real, maybe oh, their mum writes... Sorry, sorry. Echo okay, let me try holding the mic a bit closer, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Can we speak up? Sorry? Uh, yeah, I can hold it like this. Yeah. Yeah, so when you have a normal signature, you're just trying to verify that the note saying that a child is um, trying to get out of PE actually comes from their mum rather than from, say, the child. Um, obviously, this is something which is very forgeable. I'm sure most people in this room have forged their mum's signature at some point in time. But in the digital world, this is less easy. If we try to have a cryptographic signature, then it is genuinely ca the case that when you generate that signature, it should be very difficult to forge it. So in particular, if somebody who is not the person who's trying to sign the message tries to sign the message, they just won't be able to, it won't pass verification. Which means that when it comes to where do we use these things in the real world, on the internet, the answer is everywhere. Anytime you connect to any secure website, you will be using HTTPS, which is a secure internet communication protocol, which amongst other things is using digital signatures in order to say that the person who you're speaking to is the person who you think you're speaking to. This is especially important when you're talking about financial transactions and banks have been using crypto, uh, cryptographic signatures for a very long time, especially any time you do any form of chip and pin or um, anything over the internet again. And obviously in cryptocurrencies, all cryptocurrency transactions are signed. This is like the main way that we have in order to stop other people from spending your coins. There are three cryptographic signatures that are widely used. The first one, and possibly the most important one, is, is the Schnorr signing algorithm. So Schnorr signing algorithms are good for many reasons. They're very small, they're very simple, they're easy to verify, they're used using sort of very lightweight techniques. But they had a patent for many, many years. Um, it expired in 2008, but this was certainly um, too late for Bitcoin to use it. Technically, I guess it could have done, but it was widely not the case that um, Schnorr signatures were used at this point in time because of this patent. It did a lot of damage. The alternative that people have been using instead is ECDSA signatures. And these underlined, uh, were the signature scheme that were underlying Bitcoin for many, many years. Actually, they have um, switched to Schnorr recently, but previously they were using ECDSA, and they're still used for Ethereum transactions. These are less simple, a little bit less secure. This is not to say not secure, like if you can forge ECDSA signatures and bad things are happening, but we have more guarantees about Schnorr signatures than we do about ECDSA signatures. And importantly for this talk, they're much harder to thresholdize. The third important one are BLS signatures. And these are used in Ethereum proof of stake. So they're used if you want to be a validator. They're slower than uh, Schnorr or ECDSA and they require heavier tooling. In particular, they require pairings, if any of you know what those are. This is not allowed in all systems. But they do have some very nice properties for more complicated features that you might be trying to build. So in particular, they are deterministic. So given a message, you always produce the same signature. They're very easy to aggregate, which is the reason why we're using them in proof of stake. It's because we're able to really press down the amount of information which we're sending over the network 
by just um, squeezing all these signatures together. And they're also very easy to thresholdize. With a threshold cryptogra cryptographic signature, we're still trying to generate a signature. Um, but with a normal signature, you would be trying to sign for one person. With threshold schemes, you're trying to sign for a group of people. So the signature would only be valid if many people sign that message. In this particular example, 10 people would need to sign that message for it to be considered a signed message. A classic case where this might be used is if you're wanting to back up your cryptocurrency wallet. So if you're trying to do backups, maybe you don't trust yourself to store your coins, maybe you want to ask a third party to store them for you, but this obviously comes with some risks attached because if um, the third party decides to steal your coins, there's very little you can do about that. However, if you decide to not trust one third party but many th third parties, then it's much harder to steal your coins. The catch with this, though, is that now if you lose your access to your wallet, you lose your coins. So now you've split it amongst 10 people, and if one of them loses access to their wallet, then it doesn't matter the fact that you have nine other people with those coins, you would still not have access to your own coins. So even though they've not stolen them, they've effectively lost them, which would be bad for you. Which is the reason why when we're trying to do threshold cryptographic signatures, we're not trying to say 10 out of 10 must sign. We're instead trying to say something along the lines of 7 out of 10 must sign, or 3 out of 10, or 5 out of 10. You can choose the threshold that you want to choose. And in particular, it should not matter which set of 7 are signing at this particular time. If any set of 7 of the 10 sign, you're good. So few different combos here to illustrate that. However, if you're in a situation where you don't have seven people, you only have six people that are wanting to sign this message, sign this transaction, they shouldn't be able to do anything at all. They shouldn't be able to steal your money because there's only six of them, there's not seven of them, so that's below your threshold. What's actually going on under the hood here is something called Shamir's secret sharing algorithm. There are lots of different um, threshold um, cryptographic signatures in the literature using all sorts of different techniques and describing different ways of do it, doing it. But ultimately, every single one of them ultimately boils down to Shamir's secret sharing algorithm. There's a nice explanation of it on Wikipedia. It's a classic. So if you want to know inf more information about it, I'm not allowed to provide maths in these slides, so I haven't gone there, but it's all there. An important feature about a threshold signature is that it must be backwards compatible with the existing signature scheme. So we don't want it to be the case that this is a seven out of 10 signature scheme which looks very different from a single person signing. We want it to be indistinguishable, right? Because ultimately a Bitcoin transaction is a Bitcoin transaction and an Ethereum transaction is an Ethereum transaction. You don't really want to know how it was produced. And this backwards compatibility thing is easier with some signature schemes than with others. In particular, the BLS signature scheme, very, very easy, very nice to do. BLS has lots of nice properties. If you want to thresholdize BLS, it's, you, you just thresholdize it. You don't have to do anything special. Um, it also satisfies some stronger security notions. Um, in particular, it satisfies something called adaptive security, which I'm also not going to go into, but I am going to sort of say that there's been a nice paper on this recently, if you're interested. Uh, Schnorr signature schemes, the uh, first one that I mentioned, are a bit different in the sense that um, if you do it the naive way, the basic way, the first way that many people thought to do for a very long period of time, it's not actually secure. There is an attack. The attack is a fairly recent attack, actually, that can be found in, on the insecurity of ROS. And it basically relies on the fact that if you're trying to produce 10 signatures at the same time, rather than producing one signature and then another signature and then another signature, there's more tricks you can do. And this attack is fast. 
And when I say fast, I mean I coded it up in Python in an afternoon, and it runs in a couple of seconds, including the time to actually you know, generate the signatures. In Python, it's not an optimized thing. This is a scary attack. So if you want to not be susceptible to this attack, then there are ways around it. In particular, there is the thrust threshold signing algorithm, which was designed specifically to try and get around this attack, actually. And there's some security arguments as to why we think that it is not susceptible to these attacks. <coughs> um, one of the security proofs is by myself, so I'm certainly very biased here, but I believe that it is secure. Um, actually, go back a slide. Um, also, there is currently a CFRG draft in progress. This is um, being generated by a standards body called the IRTF. IRTF, yep. And it's still a draft. It's not gone through yet, but it has been looked at by quite a lot of people at this point in time, and it has had lots of people sort of investigating it. So it's probably one of the better options right now. ECDSA is harder again. In the case of ECDSA, um, we do have some results, especially some recent results, um, which look fairly promising as to this being something which is possible to do. It's not like theoretically you can't do this. But it was designed in such a way that a lot of the operations are not quite as like pretty looking as the Schnorr operations are, specifically because they were trying to make it not look like Schnorr because they wanted to get around that patent. And these less pretty operations which have been introduced require much heavier tooling if you want to do it in a multi-party setting. Like we don't have clean ways to do it. We have to use pretty much, I'm going to say, the full power of multi-party computation. Earlier today, it was sort of mentioned multi-party computation, threshold signatures, what is the difference? Multi-party computation refers to any kind of computation that you want to do in a group. So not just signatures, but if you want to, I don't know, produce an encryption, for example, then that would still fall under MPC. Um, general MPC means you can compute anything. And for ECDSA, you pretty much need general MPC. Uh, that's the end of my talk. So if you have any questions, otherwise, thank you for listening. Yep. You can use them. Uh, I mean, this isn't necessarily a smart contract thing. They're more general than that. Anything which is using signatures, including things that aren't related to cryptocurrency at all, for that matter, like the even if you're trying to do it for like banking applications or for secure internet communication, you can still thresholdize it. Okay, so for smart contract wallets, they are using ECDSA, so it's a bit trickier. I don't think that we're there yet, but I do know that there are a lot of people working on it, and it's a big, big thing that people are targeting. Any other questions? Karen Watts, Karen Barnes, and Matthew Murray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.